um, paper session. Uh, so we have now three short presentations, five minutes each. And then as usual, we have time for questions. So let's start with uh, the first speaker. So do we have the first speaker? Yes, I'm here. Okay. You are beyond, you are on stage now. Yes, exactly. And you have five minutes. So I do my best. Okay, so hello from my side. Um, I'm here to motivate you for the concept of an autonomous avionics platform and the resulting software engineering challenges. So what you see in the background is the so-called avionics bay, which is usually situated below the cockpit of, an, of a modern aircraft. And what you see in the racks are um, 50 to 100 computers forming a distributed computing system responsible for the comfort and safety on board of the aircraft. And what we are trying to do is sketched in this uh, little cartoon on the bottom of the slides. Um, we would like to create a so-called plug-and-fly avionic system, which is in, in the first sense self-configuring, um, which is also self-optimizing, self-healing. And why would we like to do that? First of all, because uh, creating this distributed system is, um, needs quite some effort in the integration phase. Second, a autonomic avionic system would allow easy updates later on both of hardware and software. It would also allow additional redundancy mechanisms and could also save resources because not all of those functions are needed in every flight phase. So the question is, uh, why, why don't, shall we do that? Um, first of all, the technical feasibility in that domain is not proven. Um, however, I think that it's doable. Um, it has to be safe. So I myself would like to enter such an aircraft with a good feeling. Um, that is also a challenge, but also doable. Um, the main reason why um, you would maybe be kicked out of the room on an aerospace conference is such um, things must be certified. And I don't want to bother you with, with regulations here, but actually certification is uh, quite laborious. It, it is very manual and very paper-based. And at the end, most of what you do is based on that you know every state and every behavior of your system before and have tested that and documented that. And that is quite in contradiction to something that is self-adaptive. So anyhow, um, we think there's a way to realize that. Um, we created this um, concept here based on something that is established in aerospace, um, which is a strictly time and memory partitioning operating system. And we think we can map the map K loop on four different partitions. Actually, the, the most interesting point is that we have the most um, complex algorithms in the first part, which doesn't need the highest um, design assurance level. So the higher the design assurance level, the more effort you have. And instead of that, what we would like to have is a so-called um, qualification part in the map K cycle. So it's a map A, Q, E, K cycle where the system itself can mimic the uh, manual activities of a qualification authority in order to prove that that is um, safe and, and, and working what is decided in this cycle. Actually, that's the first edition. The second edition that um, this MAPK cycle is also something that um, can make the system fail. So that needs to be redundant as well. So we need a redundant MAPK cycle and also some consensus mechanisms, at least on the qualification and execution part. So we have partially um, implemented parts of that. Um, however, there are several challenges open and we don't want to be single barriers here. So um, I just want to provide those challenges to the community. Um, one challenge that we see is the, the knowledge that we need to manage that system um, needs also to be part of qualified software. And we, we currently imagine to store that in a domain specific model. And we don't have any implementation of a domain specific model that is qualifiable so far. So that is one challenge. Another challenge is the consensus of this complex um, hierarchic data, which is stored there. Um, we are very good in, in providing consensus on, on primitive values, but um, those algorithms will be quite inefficient, maybe infeasible if you have complex models there. 
And maybe the bit largest challenge here is the qualify part um, where we mimic qualification activities. Um, first of all, this must work technically such that we think everything is um, safe, secure and working. And last of all, that must be agreed with certification authorities in order to have an equivalent level of, of safety. Okay, um, I will finish with a small teaser. Um, so any, any commands and any recommendations are welcome to our project. Anyhow, we have a, a um, project started on creating plug and fly and the objective is to show the technical feasibility and the first way to certification. We started last autumn um, and just from yesterday, I brought you some small video. Um, we hope that in two years, we can fly this quadrotor here um, with a online reconfiguration without that you don't see anything um, during flight. So actually what you see is just a testing um, thing. There is no autonomic system on board. Uh, thank you very much. I don't want to sound too raw, but time is over. And so sure, we I'm, must... I'm, I'm finished. Okay, good. And so we must move to the second paper. So, and to the second speaker. So do we have the speaker? Yes. I'm right here. Byron. Good. Please. All right. Yeah, I'm Byron, and this is the analysis and monitoring of cyber physical systems via environmental domain knowledge and modeling. So oftentimes when we think about the environment, what we're interested in is problems that occur within the environment. And two extremes are first just trying to enumerate absolutely everything. The problem is that's just not possible uh, as we've talked about in the last couple of days. And, and even if it was, these scenarios are gonna change over time. So things that were feasible are no longer feasible. Things that were problematic are no longer problematic and vice versa. Um, on the other extreme, we could just search for problematic environmental scenarios. Um, but that will also include these infeasible scenarios, things that won't happen in the real world and we then have to determine if those are feasible. And the minute we start making that determination, that's gonna change over time as well. So instead of attempting to find these problems and enumerate them, what we've done is we've looked at the environment as a communicating system. So we have a system, we have a simplified model of the environment. Uh, in the paper, we've got a baby monitor that creates an alarm sound and the environment as a system that creates some motion and weight. Um, but there's more detail on that in the paper. But when we have this enumerated environment from this model, we have a couple possibilities. First, we have things that we've enumerated but aren't actually going to ever happen. And, and so those are incorrect knowns. We, we don't necessarily care about those because they don't happen. We have things that we've enumerated and do happen. And, and so those, those are good. That's known knowns. Those are things that we're, we're happy about. And then we've got things that we can't determine at design time or could even change at runtime, which are these unknown unknowns, things we haven't included in our model, but that do occur, right? So what we want at design time is we want a satisfied environmental model, uh, realistically, because if we were perfect, if we had a perfect environmental model, it would always be satisfied. The environment always does what the environment does. And we could verify that against this assumed environment. But that's not practical, right? So what we realize is that there's going to be times when we have an unsatisfied environmental model, right? And so these can be some of those, you know, known, unknown, unknowns from David Garland's talk two days ago, where it appears as though something either fails or succeeds, but we know that that's not something that we expected in the environment. And so we can't for certain say that that's true, right? in which case we're probably going to have to do some adaptation or move to a fail safe or at least be aware of that possibility. Now, there are some limitations. This assumes that the specifications of the system environment are correct, at least enough. The system with respect to the implementation, the environment, the, the less correct it is, the less useful it is. And then, of course, there's the difficulty of distinguishing between environmental scenarios if we don't have enough information about the environment. An example is limited sensors. Uh, if we can't distinguish between two different environmental scenarios, there may be an environmental scenario that appears to be uh, enumerated, but actually isn't. Um, and so 
that in, environmental information is is a huge, huge uh, a problem potentially. So what we've done, um, we've presented an approach to detect these unenumerated scenarios. We've demonstrated it in a baby monitor that's in the paper and in the longer presentation. And, and our hope is to add temporal and relaxed properties um, actually adapt in these unenumerated scenarios. So move beyond just the monitoring and a little bit of analysis in the MAPE-K cycle, and then attempt to address this distribution of sensors for both multi-system analysis and the problems that occur in distinguishing between uh, different environmental scenarios. All right, thank you. Okay, hey, thank you very much. And so now we have the, the third and the last presentation uh, of the session. So I'm not sure if Claudia or Mermouche. Yeah, I'm going. here. Okay. I, uh, do you yeah. see my screen? No. Um, we see you, but not your screen. Now, now? yes, now okay. we see it. Good. Okay, great. So, um, hi everyone. Welcome to this pitch for Robomax, a robotic mission adaptation exemplar collection. I'm Mehnoush presenting our work today. Uh, hopefully you got a chance to view our video presentation and read our paper for better understanding of, of it. Here I just introduce the challenges, the solution and the value that it provides. Uh, so the use of robotic applications is rapidly growing in many different domains, and that leads to more complex tasks that ask for more adaptability with various external factors, such as human operators, other robots or devices active in, uh, in the environment, and the uncertainty of working in a dynamic operating environment in a realistic setting in general. So we need effective controller software that provides self-adaptability, which in turn asks for a clear understanding of self-adaptation requirements. The problem here is the lack of models that practitioners and system designers can refer to for a comprehensive understanding of those requirements. To provide practitioners with the information they need, we propose Robomax, a repository of robotic mission adaptation exemplars that we collected from the robotic community, both academia and industry. And it could be used to develop, evaluate, and compare self-adaptation approaches for robotic applications. Um, uh, Robomax is provided by the robotic community to serve the robotic community. So we have a public, publicly available questionnaire with several questions concerning certain aspects of robotic applications that have been selected based on several analyses published in important venues about uh, robotic applications. System designers and practitioners could fill this questionnaire and submit it to us. Then we will review the inserted information, see if uh, any clarifications or modifications are needed. And after a few iterations, um, we'll have a curated exemplar that we can add to our repository. Uh, the review and evaluation of the inserted information by pra practitioners is done uh, by experts in robotics and or requirement spe specification. So to make sure that the exemplar is actually reflecting uh, realistic information. Um, each exemplar contains a set of predefined and attentively selected information that contains general information, such as the domain of the application, description of the robot system, the sources of the um, exemplar being industry or academia, and provider contacts. Natural, naturally, it also contains more specific data, such as the sources of uncertainty, adaptation types, concerns, and constraints. For items four, five, and six, uh, we uh, offer practitioners with many options that we collected from different studies to make it easier for them to insert useful information and also for us to be able to curate each exemplar uh, easier later. Uh, these options are explained in the paper extensively. Um, in addition to our options, we also allow the users to add extra data that doesn't fit in uh, our current classification. Observing this extra information could bring to our attention features that worth being in our exemplar, um, and we can eventually enrich our questionnaire with like more options. So it's a continuous process. We are also working on incorporating the concerns of well-known robotic standards into our questionnaire. From the information inserted by 
uh, people who um, fill our questionnaire, we then can extract the statistics and charts to provide practitioners with snapshots of the requirements based on which they can uh, make decision making. They can understand, uh, for example, which requirements are absolutely necessary and define applications that already meet these requirements by design. Um, in the paper, we showed some plots and some stats based on the current state of the repository, which contains 11 exemplars. The distribution of the requirements could change as the number of exemplars um, grow or if the uh, population of industrial exemplars become larger than academic ones or the other way around. Um, so if you happen to work with well-defined robotic exemplars, please consider submitting them to our questionnaire, which you can uh, reach using the links provided here. Um, this slide is also in the presentation deck. So if you have access to that via the conference platform, you can, you can find these links there, or you can also search Robomax in GitHub, or you can contact us directly. We will be more than happy to, to work with you. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you very much, Mernoush. Uh, and now I think we have time for questions. I don't know whether we have 20 minutes or the original 35, but I don't think it's a big issue. So according to uh, the names I have uh, on the chat, uh, Danny is the first. I think that Rogerio had a question before me, Luciano, if I see it here, correct. Okay, Rogerio, sorry, my, my bad. No, no problem. You, the, you, the chair, you decide. All right. Thank you, Danny. All right. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Rogerio, don't worry. Yeah. Don't worry. Don't worry. All right. So, uh, Bjorn, I, I, I really enjoy your, 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 your presentation. I really enjoy your case study. I think we should, should go push the boundaries. What is possible, what is acceptable is not acceptable. All right in the sense that you're in the completely different application in which you have got to provide very strong guarantees, essentially, what you're going to deploy. So now finishing the niceties, all right? So my question essentially is, all right, what, what, are, what are the risks, all right, of the plane with your software, all right, uh, behave in a way that the pilot is not expected? To behave, all right. So, and you see this recently on 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 the the seven thirty seven max, all right. And I'm saying this based on your diagram, what you presented. So, what you've got there is a map loop with redundancies, all right. So, once you've got redundancies, all right. So, these that's the nature of uncertainties. If you're not deterministic in which output to consider. All right. I want to manage different outputs. All right. So my my my, my so my question is, it was the question. It was, what what's the, the risk of the plane expressing some type of behavior, behaving the way that the pilot is not a not in this, doesn't understand. Mm -hmm. So the first simple answer is um, there's always a risk. So there's never never zero risk. Um, to prevent any misunderstanding um, in the current stage of our project, we are not thinking about adapting the behavior of the vehicle itself. The only thing that is self-managed is the distributed computing system itself. So what kind of components do I have? What topology, what redundancy do I need? That is adapted. Um, still, there would be the risk that the system decides to maybe disable some function that is needed by the pilot. However, um, if this decision is taken, then this, um, in the software architecture, see this decision is taken within a qualified part of the software. And then it's an error. And, and the, the, the goal of qualifications actually prevents those errors. Um, that's the same today. So even today, the software can fail, even if it's, if it's qualified. And you mentioned that to your, yourself. Um, but the, the thing I'm, uh, but the thing I was saying is that this, the, your system, which now adapts, might get to the state that actually even the pilot doesn't understand what's going on. And, and at least from your talk, there is no such guarantee that this might not happen. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. So, so the function will be there as long as the resources are necessary to provide the function, for, for example, flight controls. 
So we don't adapt any flight controls. The only thing can happen that there are insufficient resources to run the flight control functions anymore. But that's the same today. If all redundancies fail, then flight controls will not work anymore. Okay, I'll pass because I'm talking about deployment of resources, which is okay, yep. fine, I'll pass it. Now, Danny. Actually, my, um, actually, my question is very similar to Rogerio's question. Uh, I look at it from, uh, from a verification validation point of view. A traditional, a traditional approach will, very, will do verification of models of systems and then follow up, of course, by validation to make sure that the real system will also comply with this, with this validate. And that gives the guarantees and that will give the certification. Now, if you, if you do what you suggest and you push this into the runtime, I'm not saying that this is not interesting. Eh? <laughs> I'm just wondering, I mean, now we need to have evidence at the level of models, maybe also the system because the system is flying and maybe we can collect data and maybe we can do some kind of on the fly validation, but this seems to be a complex, a complex matter. And without validation, we are reasoning at the level of models and that gives us only validation at the level of models, which might fail, of course, since models are abstractions that we might have missed things, which I think directly relates to what Rogerio was saying. But maybe your answer already somehow covered it. I don't know if you'd like to add something else, please. Um, actually, it's challenging. I confirm it's challenging. Um, concerning the models, I think we have two models that are, are due to validation. Um, first of all, the function that needs to be executed and what, what happens if the function is not executed. Um, here we envision that this model can be designed offline and validated offline. So it's built up of, of, of pre-qualified blocks as, as written in the paper. Um, what needs to be considered online is the knowledge of the system about its, its own state. So how many resources are free, where are the functions distributed, that needs to be validated during runtime. Um, first of all, um, we try to establish mechanisms that, the, that there are only a minimum number of error sources in detecting the current state, like, like fraud proof topology detection, detection and, and something in addition. And the final validation will happen in this qualification partition where we think about mechanisms um, just to, to give a consensus on the current state of the system. So if you have, for example, three or four redundancies detecting the topology, deciding the next plan, and then we have a, a, a just, yes, majority of three of those computers that have exactly the same opinion and one is against, then this um, is, may be sufficient, um, a sufficient statement in, in saying the model is valid for the current situation. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, this sounds reasonable, but I mean, still, I think, <clears throat> I think your work, if I may, Luciano, one more minute. Yeah, sure. Uh, your work originates from the fact that, that the whole thing is complex eh? as it is now, like oh, with, with your million parameters and, and that everything is done by, by, by experts. But now, okay, of course, uh, we want to automate things, but still then I wonder for this kind of life critical systems, I'm, I'm a bit conservative, let's say, to, uh, to move it into risks at runtime. Uh, now, there is of course a whole a range of criticality and then maybe you give an example now really to the extreme uh, there are of course systems where and stakeholders can be involved here as well uh, of course uh, the the pilot can have a say if the system wants to make a change or whatever uh, but anyway I, I like the work it's interesting to to explore the issue of certification at runtime uh, I, have you ever seen to the work of interest that uh, Radu Kalunescu and, 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 uh, and my group did uh, Entrust that we published a few years ago. It might be of interest for you because it's also about criticality and, 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 and online uh, assurance cases. And in fact, basically making certification Danny. a dynamic process that goes on in the runtime. So we Michael. also have other questions to the other speakers. So. Sorry, Luciano. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, Sona, do you want to? 
Uh, yeah, sure. But but I think my question was partly covered by by Danny and and Rogerio. Okay. Are you okay with the answer so far? Yeah, I think I am. I am covered. Thank you. Okay. Then Gabriel. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for your very interesting work, and uh, I'm glad to see that uh, you are doing this with the EU Aviation Safety Agency. That's uh, that's really nice. Um, so my first question is uh, somewhat similar to what Danny was saying, and is that uh, the qualification part in the normal certification process is very uh, human effort intensive. So uh, I was wondering if, uh, if you can briefly say what are the ideas you have to be able to automate that, and not only automate that, but do that at uh, development assurance level A. Yes. So maybe the last part of your question, uh, development assurance level A, um, that will be really challenging. And, and especially as a university, I, I think we can never accomplish that in, in reality, but we can try to pave the way to that direction. Um, for the virtual qualification activities that we are trying to do, um, we are also quite conservative. We, we just imagine that we just mimic what um, you usually as an engineer would do. You would, would um, for example, um, run test cases on your requirements, uh, document that, you would, would um, take a look at your coverage, you would um, make a system safety analysis and a system security analysis. And we try to put that into algorithms so that we have the same um, qualification artifacts after, afterwards. So we have test reports, we have um, fault trees, for example, attack trees and, and something like that. Um, however, um, that doesn't, so it doesn't make sense to just uh, generate that automatically and then print that out before you start because I, I would like to be able to reconfigure it during runtime. So the idea is that um, we provide evidence that all those artifacts are there if you need them, but you don't have to, to, to look at them at, at the beginning. So that's the idea we currently have. But, mm -hmm. but very true is that it's completely incompatible with the current regulations. Yeah, I see that. Um, okay. I have a, a quick one, uh, which is the, the planning part is uh, done at uh, not a high uh, development assurance level. And if that fails, doesn't that preclude everything else in the adaptation loop to execute? And, and what, what are the consequences of that? Yes, that is one of the first questions always. Um, so actually, we, we won't go flying if we don't have a first configuration that is uh, suitable. So that's the first uh, safety net. Um, the second sa safety net, net is that um, I don't think we will ever fly if we don't have the traditional redundancies as well. So if every, anything fails, any hardware failure you have, you still have a hot by redundancy that takes over um, independent of any reconfiguration. What, what reconfiguration and self-adaptation can bring into is that you can re-establish some redundancies later on or, or you can save resources or something like that. But if you have a failure, you can't, can't reconfigure because reconfiguration fails as, as well. You continue as it was and that should be sufficient to reach the next airport or something. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Let's try to move to the, to the, the second speaker and let's try to ask Danny uh, about his question for Byron. Byron, Danny. I have a simple question. Uh, you give an example in your movie, at least I saw the movie before and also I don't know exactly whether you show it here, but if, uh, if there is a value of some parameter outside of the range, uh, to what extent, uh, how do you qualify this kind of, uh, of uncertainty, if you like? Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Um, within the context of this research, I would say and it's kind of the known, unknown, unknown that you, you stated in your, in your text question since we treat known unknowns as unknown unknowns because they're not documented within the environmental model. Um, so they're unknown unknowns with respect to the models, not necessarily to the system designer. If they were then included in the models, then they'd be considered differently. Yeah, sounds fair enough. Huh? Thank you. So are Thank there you. other questions to uh, Byron uh, before we move to uh, well, there's another one for Bjorn by Claudio. Um, 
Yes, you, you mentioned that one of the main problems in the avionic domain is certification, right? Which means that probably your approach, it kind of should be approved by, first of all, the engineers in the company, right? Um, they're going to, so did you have any discussion with actual engineers working in the avionic domain on your approach, how complex it was, was, was the feedback kind of, if you have any? So you're addressing the, I would say the core software, which needs to be qualified. Is that your question? Um, I'm asking because of course you mentioned, okay, you proposed a new kind of approach, right? To, to, inter to be integrated within kind of um, an avionic system, right? How complex is to, to, to apply this in practice and, be, and kind of have it certified? Did you discuss with people from the avionic domain like in the sense, okay, embedded this approach in our kind of product is relatively simple and having it certified, it, I don't know, it takes a couple of months, takes year. I mean, did you have any kind of feedback from the industrial domain? Yes, so we have strong uh, relationships to industrial uh, companies. Um, I can't provide you any exact number how long it would take or how many employees you need to, to certify something like that. Um, and as a university, I, I told you we will never do that. So at the end, the industry must certify something like that. Um, I still think it's doable. Um, we do our best because we try to use methods that are accepted. For example, we try to implement all the critical parts in, in the ADA language and try also to use this um, formal verification tool called Spark in order to provide some simplification on certification. Um, and also, if you look at the avionics domain, you will find many, many um, yes, operating system which are far less complex than your, your home operating system, but they are certified in, in a general way. And what we put onto that is something like a, I would say middleware. And so it, it should be doable. That's my answer here. Thank you. Okay, so now, now let's go to Sona again uh, for Mernouche. Uh, yes, thanks for the talk, Mernouche. I think it's, uh, I appreciate the effort in, uh, in collecting exemplars for this specific, uh, these robotic missions as a, as a repository. But uh, my, my concern was that in addition to the, to the information you collect in your questionnaire from the, the authors of those exemplars or developers, um, what, what are the other, are there any at all? And if yes, what are the, uh, quality check steps that uh, you, you, you consider before adding uh, such an exemplar to your repository that could later on serve as a comparison baseline for robotic solutions. Um, so uh, we have at least two of our like authors, two people basically separately um, review each scenario and then uh, they combine their comments together and we reach out to the uh, to the provider for uh, for any kind of uh, correction or verification that is required. At the moment, it's being done manually, uh, which is kind of manageable with the number of considering the number of submissions that we have for now. But uh, but in time, uh, you know, we hope that we'll be able to uh, in, to uh, kind of improve this process. But uh, yeah, this phase there is a phase of verification before actually adding that to uh, to the repository and finalizing it. Okay. Uh, okay, so there's another question for Mernouch by Ilias. Yes, uh, I think you answered it indirectly, but uh, I was wondering, uh, would it make sense, uh, apart from this uh, verification, I'm, I'm thinking about the validation step in the, from the keynote, right? So, of course, it's, it's a different kind of validation, but um, wouldn't, wouldn't it make sense to bring back the, cha the changes as suggested changes to the actual submitters of an exemplar and see whether they agree or disagree uh, with, uh, with what the owners of the repository say? I mean, shouldn't it be more of a co-creation uh, activity? Um, I think this is what, what I, what I meant. So ah, okay. we go back to, we go back to who actually submitted the scenario yes. with the changes or modifications that we think is necessary. And then uh, 
we wait for their feedback. So basically, and then changes doesn't mean that we ask them to change their application, right? Yeah. It may be that we kind of ask them to better articulate their requirements. Maybe something is implicit. We just have to verify with them if our understanding was correct because it wasn't expressed uh, explicitly, or maybe there is some inconsistency in the explanation of the task. So it's like, we don't really ask them to change their application. We just ask them to better describe it for us. And who else rather than the uh, practitioner himself? The, no, no, the person I, 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 the I, yeah. I agree, I agree. I, I find it, so, so basically there has to be some consensus in the end. So they have, both parties exactly. have to agree, okay, this is what we exactly. mean. Okay, yes, this is what you mean. Okay, yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. Uh, well, unless there are other questions, I do have a question for Mernoush. So suppose that I want to embed uh, your exemplars or one of the exemplars in my work. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to demonstrate that, for example, my uh, wonderful solution can manage that or that. Uh, what should I do? Mm -hmm. um, do you want to refer to specifically one of them or like... Um, what is what is exactly so the, the point is suppose that i want to use your exemplar uh, to demonstrate mm -hmm. that my solution uh, is good enough or can manage one of them or all of them uh, what should i do should i implement them uh, from scratch uh, are there reusable elements uh, what should i do so what we provide basically is a, is a tool for comparison and like evaluation. So you kind of say, I have this robotic scenario and um, like I, I added these uh, specific, I consider these specific requirements for uh, providing self-adaptive solutions because there was some, um, some repository that actually kind of gave me indications of what are the requirements that I need to consider or take into it into account basically. So uh, you can somehow uh, like say or claim that you, the self-adaptation solution that you provided is good with respect to the state of the art based on the statistics that our repository actually provides for you. Okay, but there's no way I can, well, if I want to, to make it work, I have to implement it. Am, am I correct? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by implementing. Well, because it's I, I, I have to create the software to make it work. Um, it's not a software, basically. It's a collection, a repository. In, no, no, in I know. You don't have the software. And as such, if I need the software, uh, I must create it. That, that, that's my point. Can, um, can, I, can I jump in? Maybe? Yeah, yeah, sure. So the exemplar basically are at the natural language description. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's the mission and the, and the, so we, we choose on purpose uh, to not uh, fix ourselves to any specific uh, language for, I mean, uh, to allow people to uh, also be able to compare their languages. So yes, the answer is yes. You you must take the requirement in other language, encode it into your, your language or software. Yes. Well, well for sure, for sure, I was trying to misuse your work, but I was just asking. So. <laughs> yeah, but also. Uh, if we wanted to provide a fixed implementation, then it was it would also like limit the scope of works that we could collect, right? So we could only it would constrain us to a certain like language, certain type of implementation. No, no, no. That wasn't really. No, what I wanted to do is that instead of saying that you know I implement uh, my own exemplars, uh, I use the implementations done by others mm -hmm. in order to say, okay, you know. I simply reused that implementation and the system works. So that, that, that was my point. But I, I, I clearly agree with you and see uh, you know, the, 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 the goal of your work. And so mm -hmm. I was trying to misuse it. Uh, now there's Danny who would like to yeah, say I, or add something. I would add to this discussion, basically. It's of course a matter of a trade-off here. From the beginning, we have this ID that exemplars can also be just descriptions of problems or even be data or whatever. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you have to see the trade of that Luciano is trying to raise here is that if you have an artifact that is implemented, okay, that is specific. But the advantage of having something specific is that if he develops it and he gives results with his approach, I can use his, 
his system and I can do it with my approach and I can directly compare the results. I think in your case, you assume that if someone uses a scenario, that he implements a scenario. And if I then want to use your scenario, I can compare it then with the implementation of someone else who has implemented it, eh? right? Right. Yeah, okay. Good, thank you. Well, we also have a kind of private discussion. Yeah, just a second, Jeff. Uh, we also have a private discussion going on on the chat. So I think, I assume that everybody can read it uh, if interested in that. And now, uh, Jeff. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I'd like to sort of follow up from what Luciana was trying, was, was I think hinting at. Um, it, would be, it would be very useful. I mean, having exemplars is a wonderful thing. But having implementations or something of them is are actually far more useful in the sense that one can actually, is exactly what you're saying, is implement your particular approach against something like that. I mean, is there any initiative, for instance, to create maybe the domain model? So you could have a domain model of whatever the exemplar is, describes that with its assumptions and so on or perhaps a simulation. So what happens is that you've got a simulation of the environment, which you can then play your system against. I mean, something like this would actually be, I would have thought a really useful extension. I'm not saying what, you, what you've done is actually very useful, but as an extension to that would then be these kinds of uh, environments that one could actually play your system against. Is there any initiative or thought about doing something like that? So yeah, basically we kind of thought of, of defining sort of a dominant specific language that um, helps to uh, better express these, these specifications and requirements. But also like, because this work is still like at its initial steps, we also are thinking of, uh, of like which direction to go to. Do we have to, because you know, robotic applications have different domains and have different subdomains and each of them has its specific requirements. Like for example, um, collaborative robotic is very different from, um, I don't know, like um, personal care, for example, ro robots. So we are kind of uh, more thinking, deciding where to position ourselves and then how to define it, like how is it to define a dominant specific language that actually covers um, like a good uh, uh, subset of all these sort of applications. Is it better to do that or is it better to specifically go in one direction of one of these specific domains? So we're kind of exploring the possibilities and, and yes, we kind of are working on defining a um, kind of formal way of, of describing specifications of robotic applications. Just as a, as, a, as a comment, I would have said that mm -hmm. defining new, uh, so say, domain-specific languages is, is, pro is a whole different research agenda. I mean, pro providing, let's say, artifacts which are actually useful to the community, which I think is the main motive for, for what you're doing with exemplars, would actually be rather creating real artifacts, simulations, uh, real, you know, real models that we can actually test against rather than uh, that's a, you know another line of research but that's that's just my opinion um well yeah but in order to make these things comparable still there should be some kind of that, that like a unique way of, of describing them and comparing them to one another so yeah <laughs> so any other I, I don't want to dominate the conversation here no but no I, no i'm not sure we i have, agree we, we have time so do you want to continue, Jeff? I, yes, I, I would have said, you know, there's, there's one thing. Uh, if, if people are going to compare against each other, they're not going to compare different exemplars against each other. They're going mm -hmm. to compare the same example. So they're going to take that one and say, how does my system work against them and what are the advantages and somebody else? So as essentially a comparison thing would be against the same example. Comparing different examples actually is 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 probably i i would have said probably fruitless in fact okay um, i'm not sure if that's what you intended i i don't know um i i mostly kind of um, intended to say that the same example uh, could be like, expressed differently like maybe with a uh, different level of formalization, different level of like granularity of, of describing the requirements of the application, not two different examples, the same example, but, like, but in two different ways with two different languages. Okay, okay I, I, I understand. 
let's try to move to CMOS. Yeah, just you know, offering my uh, some of some of the experience that we had in the past with this, with uh, working with robotics. It's, uh, I mean, it's it's definitely very very useful to have these uh, specifications that can be used to implement you know different robotic applications, which is you know it's one of the challenges that we typically encounter when developing new amazing solutions, as the channel said. Uh, but TV, from our experience, it is it requires a considerable amount of time to develop those robots to take the specification and develop it into something that is you know you you can embed or you, you can connect your scenes paper or your scenes theoretical work in order to evaluate it. So uh, to, yeah, this is uh, early early stages, but. I, I think that it would be in, in the future, it would be nice to, to link it with some maybe a reference implementations or have the templates or the skeleton mm -hmm. that others could, you know, easily quote, uh, attach their solution on top. And that would could be used as a, as a benchmark for, you know, subsequent applications. I know that it's not the easiest thing to do. It requires a, a good amount of effort. Uh, but it would it would be an extremely useful uh, thing for the community. Yeah, yeah, that that's definitely true. Let me let me pave the ground to the artifact evaluation track for next year. So if someone, you know, is, is willing to implement uh, these exemplars or other, clearly uh, there will be an artifact track next year. But anyway, uh, given that we are kind of running out of time. Uh, let me ask Owen if he's still interested in asking his question to Björn. Oh, I didn't realize that it would actually get to me. Yes, sure. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure if this is a this question makes sense, but Björn, uh, basically, I the the one slide you had that that uh, reminded me of the challenge I. I, my team sort of faces in, in the self-driving world is you have that one controller that is Dell star and everything else is the, like the, basically the highest level of integrity. Uh, and I'm wondering, you know, how do you, have you, do you have a sense of how you would assess the overall Dell of the, of the aircraft given that Dell star, right? Cause the Dell star is basically the way I think of it is you don't have a way of really certifying the level of integrity of that piece. The star is like quality, quality managed, perhaps, right? And we have a similar challenge with self-driving when, when it comes to a machine learning element added to the aut automotive system. Uh, ISO 26262 has a very clear way of decomposing ASIL, which really took from a similar idea as Dell. Um, so I wanted to get your experience of, of how, how, you know, how you think about that in your work. Mm -hmm. Um, so for the uh, parts that I annotated with Dell A, um, that clearly depends on the kind of vehicle you are investigating or, ta or targeting at. If you go for a civil aircraft, then, then Dell A is mandatory. So because every every function could be safety critical, so there is actually no no question mark. On on the parts that I marked by um, Dell Star, um, I'm currently unsure. Currently, I I would say because all actions are shielded by dull A software at the end, um, we maybe need no dull level at all at this partition, which would be dull E at the end. Um, however, I'm currently not sure if I have really considered all, all effects that could result from that. The, the, the one point that comes in addition is that this um, partitioning operating system ensures that that any kind of partition that is hosted cannot influence unintentionally any other partition. So it's able to host something that has no dull level at all. Nice, that's key, okay, thanks. Okay, do we have any final question, comment, concern, advertisement? Three, two, one. And then we can close the session. Thank you very much.